Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. Today we're going to build a tall case clock made out of oak. It's an arts and crafts style with a full eight-day movement. We got some of the ideas during a visit to the National Watch and Clock Museum in Columbia, Pennsylvania. We'll go there next, and then we'll come back and build our own tall case clock right here in the New Yankee Workshop. Funding is provided by... We're about a half mile from the mighty Susquehanna River. That puts us in Columbia, Pennsylvania. We're at the home of the National Watch and Clock Museum. It's great inside. Earlier, I got a tour from Terry Brotherton. Well, Terry, you have clocks of every description here. This is quite a collection. Isn't this nice? This is a row of early American tall case clocks. The lovely painted dials indicate that most of these clocks were made in the early 1800s. Oh, the dials are beautiful, and so isn't the woodworking. Nice bonnet there, turnings, and this is a mahogany veneer. You picked a beauty, Norm. Uh, this is a Pennsylvania tall case clock from about 1820, and it's uh, from the general area that the museum is from. Now, you being a woodworker, uh, I've got a clock with a wooden movement I'd like to show you. A wooden movement? Correct. I'm delighted to see that all your clocks are keeping the exact same time. We have to work hard at that, Norm. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Looky here. These are called pillar and scroll clocks. Pillar and scroll clocks change the American clock making industry. Uh, a normal tall case clock would cost around $50. The pillar and scroll brought the price down to about $15, mm. mainly because behind the beautiful wooden dial is a wooden movement with interchangeable parts. Wow. Well, I recognize that plate as being quarter sign white oak, but the wooden gears, what, cherry perhaps, or beech? Sure. And did they actually keep accurate time? Norm, they kept great time. Of course, there had to be minor adjustments, uh, you know, because of weather and things like that. And you even have cuckoo clocks. We've got it all here, Norm. <laughs> Wow, look at this piece. That's some gorgeous. pretty amazing carving. That's a good example of a German Black Forest wood carving there. Well, all the displays are wonderful. And look at this one over here. It looks like you have an area set up with a desk with clocks on the wall. What's that about? Well, you know, Norm, the railroads had to run on time. And we've got a great collection here of railroad timepieces. These are great. You know what I'm looking for is actually a tall clock where I can see the pendulum through the door. Anything like that? Got a great example over in the clock making shop that I think you'd like to see. Norm, what we have here is a turn of the century clock shop. Mm -hmm. And here's where the, the desk where the clock maker would sit. Wow, and even has a little lathe, I guess, to make parts. Right? I knew the tools would catch your eye there. Now, now, Norm, right over here is a beautiful example of a three-weight chime clock. And wow. looky there, there's your glass door you were looking for. Well, that is a wonderful piece. There is an awful lot to learn here, I know that. There really is, Norm. Uh, you take all the time you need. If you need anything, you just ask the staff and we'll take care of it. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks, Thank Norm. Thank you. Well, here it is, our version of a tall case oak clock. After I returned from the National Watch and Clock Museum, I went through my notes and I did some further research. I went on the internet and looked at clocks, went through furniture books, even catalogs where you can find clock kits and parts. And this is really a compilation of all those sources. It has a lot of arts and crafts influence. It's about six feet tall, made out of quarter sign white oak, and it's tapered. It's narrow at the top and it widens as it goes to the floor very much like a Roycroft clock that we saw at the Grove Park Inn several years ago. The lower side panel is solid oak, and there's a grill at the top to let the sound come out from the chimes. And don't be surprised if you hear it go off on the course of the day as we build this. The movement is a full mechanical movement that we acquired from a company that specializes in clock kits and clock parts, including this dial face, which I've just taped on because we'll put that on permanently after we finish the piece. The information for the movement and all the hardware will be included in the plan. So if you'd like to build your own tall case oak clock, a measure drawing is available with the materials list, and you'll hear more about that before the program ends. I want to start on these side panels. In every place you see a rail, it's joined to the style with a mortise and tenon joint. And there's a groove to receive the panel. I want to start with that groove. So I've set up the table saw with the dado. 
and a feather board. I'll run the stock through, turn it around, run it through again to center that groove. But before we use any power tools, let's talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now I'm beginning to form tenons on the end of the rails. The first cut is the shoulder cut on each face. So I've set up a guide block which controls the length of the tenon, set my blade to just the right height, and we'll run all the rails. Let's take another look at our mortise and tenon joint. If you look in the groove, you can see that I held the mortise up from the end of the style about a half inch. So as I form the tenon, I need to remove some material, but leave a bit called a haunch to fill the groove. I've readjusted the fence and I've raised the blade. All I have to do is nibble away the material. Now I've installed my tenoning jig in the miter gauge slot of the saw, and that allows me to safely hold these pieces in a vertical position while I make the cheek cuts. I always like to do a dry fit at this stage to make sure all the joints line up properly, and that looks good on both of our panels. Now here I have a little cardboard template to lay out the arch in the mid rail. I'll cut that over at the bandsaw. Slot that I cut with my slot cutter will receive the top edge of the solid wooden panel. Now this is one of the side panels. I've just cut the arch on the top so it'll fit into the frame. Now we're ready to glue up the panels. Glue in the mortise and on the tenons. However, the panel gets slipped in dry. You want that to be able to move a bit with changes in humidity. Once all the parts are together, I'll clamp it up. While the frames for the side dry, let's start working on the face frame. And because the clock is tapered, the styles are narrow at the top and wide at the bottom. And they're joined by two rails, one at the bottom, one at the top. So what I've done is taken a piece of one by eight oak and jointed the edges perfectly square. And on this side, I've laid out one of the actual styles. And I've put another line an eighth of an inch away from the layout. That's for a rough cut that I'm gonna make with the circular saw. This is the style that I just cut an eighth of an inch strong. The other edge of my stock is perfectly straight. So I can clamp that right along the actual layout lines and then use a router bit with a guide bearing against that straight edge. The cutter will trim the style smooth and straight. Now I'm taking the style that I just made, setting on top of the old straight edge, and I'm using that as a template to make another style. To assemble the face frame, I'm going to use pocket screw joinery. You've seen me use this type of joinery before. I have a little jig here, which I simply clamp in place. And using a drill, I drill a slanted pocket for the screw. Now a little glue, but it's actually the screws that really suck this together. And what I like to do is just clamp it before I drive the screws so the pieces will be even. Let's take another look at the prototype. At the bottom of the side panels, this little arched cutout, and there's also a little cutout in the face frame styles, just to create sort of a leg on the clock. I made up some templates, traced the outline on each panel, and now I'm just gonna use my jigsaw to rough it out, and then I'll smooth it with the drum sander. Doesn't that sound great? Now I'm ready to make some rabbits in the back edge of the side panels to receive the oak plywood back. On the prototype, I installed these grills permanently. 
And I learned that that was a mistake because it makes it difficult to work on the clockworks. So in this next one, I'm going to make them removable. In order to be able to remove the panels, I'm going to have to take away the material on the back side of the groove on the styles. To do that, I'm going to use my rabbiting bit and some hand tools. The next step is to make a groove for the floor, one in each side and one along the inside of the face frame. So what I've done is taken the two sides, clamped them together with a straight edge, which will guide my router, which has a quarter inch bit, to cut the groove. On the face frame, I have to make sure I stop a quarter inch from the edge. Otherwise, this groove is going to show when I assemble the case. Right, with glue in those biscuit slots, the biscuits in place, line everything up and clamp it as needed. Well, now with the sides all clamped in place, a little bit of glue on a quarter inch piece of plywood, and I'm just going to brad that to the top of the face frame and the sides. And the floor slips in these grooves, and with glue and brads, it's adding a lot of strength to this case. Six o'clock. I'd say it's quitting time. We'll finish up this project tomorrow. Nine a.m. and we're already started. First thing I did this morning was remove the case from the clamps. And now I'm working on some cleats that are going to help tie the back edges together as well as give some support for the plywood back. Just pieces of oak glued and pocket screwed in place. Another brace up here. And you'll notice that all the ends of these cleats are cut at two degrees to match the taper of the case. Now these cleats, which go just behind the face frame, will secure the dial panel. Here I'm just dry fitting some blocks of wood. These happen to be poplar. They'll get screwed and glued to the case later. And what they do is support the movement. This top piece is called the seat board, and the movement sits right on top of that. I need to cut a slot in the seat board for the cables of the weights to go through. So I'll drill a one inch hole on each end, and then I'll clean out the middle with a jigsaw. Okay, that takes care of mounting the seat board. At the bottom of the case, there are four little blocks like this, and they're for levelers. After the block is secured, put in this little peanut, and inside that goes the leveler. And these are very important because with the mechanical movement, if the clock isn't level, it won't work correctly. Now I'll attach the back with screws. You never know when you might have to get in there. The back is made up of quarter inch plywood with an oak veneer. The good side of the veneer faces inside the clock. At the top of the case, there's a smaller section of quarter inch plywood for the back, and I've glued and attached these spacer blocks. On top of the spacer blocks goes this piece of half inch plywood. It's called a chime board. It's where the chimes will be mounted later. Well, it's time to build another door for the second case, so let me show you how this one's put together on the prototype. Rails join the styles with mortise and tenon joints, just like the side panels did. There's a rabbit for the glass at the top as well as at the bottom, except down here, rather than ordering a piece of curved glass, I just remove more material so that I can get a square piece. The outside is also rabbited to overlay the frame. Let me show you how I made it. 
The styles for the door have mortises, and I used my stationary mortiser to make those. Now I've set up the table saw to make a rabbit to receive the glass. I'll do that on the styles and on the rails. One difference in the tenons for the door is that unlike the side panels where the shoulder cuts align with one another, I have to offset the shoulder cut on one side to compensate for that rabbit. With one cheek cut made, now I can lower the blade to complete the other side of the tenon. In order to make the tenons fit properly into the mortises of both the top and bottom of our door, I need to cut out this little piece, and that'll take care of it. All right. All right, a little bit of glue in the mortises and on the tenons. Slide this all together and clamp it up. While the door cooks in the clamps, let's start working on this cornice. There's this deep cove, which is one piece of it, and then a cap on top that's rounded over. I'm going to start with the cove. Here's a sample piece of that molding. And I'm going to knock the back corner off of the one and a quarter inch thick blank. And that's 30 degrees. Now, if I put the sample molding up against the blank, you can see I have a lot of material to remove. And the molding machine isn't going to be able to do that. So with the saw, I'm going to make a cut this way and this way to get the bulk of it. I had a knife from a project that I built last year, the Media Press, to make a cornice molding. I'm using that knife in my molding machine to get part of that profile. Now, I do have to rip some of this off to get it the exact size I want. The piece of molding I just made covers the quarter-inch plywood, and you can see that doesn't give me much support. So I'm going to add this backer piece. Now this piece will finish off that corner, and one corner has to be rounded with a quarter inch radius. And just to reinforce this joint, I'm using a biscuit with some glue. Using a rabbiting bit, I'm creating a 3 8 by 3 8 rabbit on the back side of the door so it can overlay the face frame. To knock off the sharp corners on the face of the door, I just used my chamfering bit. And that takes care of our door. All right, what I'm starting to do now is work on those grills, which the sound will come out through. This piece is going to be for the tops and bottoms, and what I'm doing is plowing out material to receive the verticals. It's easy to do a whole wide strip and then cut the pieces out of it after. Now I'm using the dado to make a half lap at the top and bottom of the vertical pieces. I right, a little glue on both surfaces, and I'll put some clamps on as necessary until the glue sets. All right, let that sit in the clamps for a while. Well, how did we do? 20 after 6? Not too bad. Before we put any of the hardware on or the movement, we'll take it into the finishing shop. The Stickleys would have finished a piece like this using ammonia. And we've used that process before. It's tricky, and it can potentially be hazardous. So we're turning to a method 
that I learned from an antiques dealer down in New York City. He put together a formula starting with an alcohol stain. It's actually powder mixed in alcohol. And we're going to rub that on first. It'll dry real quickly. Now, once the alcohol stain dried, we knocked down the grain, which raised a bit with some fine sandpaper. And now I'm putting on a coat of oil-based stain, and it's a dark walnut color. We'll rub it on, nice thin coat, and let that dry overnight. Now that the oil stain has dried, I'm starting to apply the protective coats. This is a wipe-on polyurethane. It's a satin finish. And I'll probably wipe on about two or three coats with a light sanding in between, and we'll be ready to put in the movement. Ah, here it is, our first completed clock. With the glass installed and the mechanical movement, it's keeping great time, and it's already a favorite around here, especially when it chimes. Now, over on the work table, I have all the clock works that are necessary for the project, and we'll give you the information where to get this in the measured drawing. It comes with all the parts and a good set of instructions. The first thing that I did was to attach these chime rods to the chime board, and now that goes back into the case. And now for the clock works. I'm going to drop these cables through the slot. And this is a very delicate piece, so I want to handle this carefully. Drop it in position, center it, and secure it. Now the instructions call for me to carefully bend the rods that hold these hammers so that they line up with the chimes, and they're about an eighth of an inch away. Next comes this piece of quarter-inch plywood. You're really not going to see it. It's the backer for the dial face, and that gets attached with some screws. Next, the clock face, and I'll secure that with a few screws. Okay, and that takes care of the hands. Now for the pendulum. And that's going to allow me to regulate the clock, either slow it down or speed it up as necessary. Now for the weights. They tell you to put the heaviest one over here on the right-hand side, and then the lighter ones in the middle and the left. All right, now for the grills, I glued the cloth on the back side of the grill. And you just pop it inside the case, slide it up, and drop it down. Now, with some patience, I can fine-tune the clock to keep perfect time, and when that's done, it sounds great. Boy, doesn't that sound great? This was a fun project. Now, let me show you what we're going to build next time. It's called a dower chest. Now, we haven't installed the hardware yet because we're going to give it a decorative paint job to look like the antique original that we found at the Wintertour Museum in Delaware. The origins of the antique were Pennsylvania German, and it was built in the early 19th century. Join us next time as we build our dower chest, right here in the New Yankee Workshop. Funding is provided by 